والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله والصحبه أجمعين ما بعد uh, First of all let me welcome everyone to uh, our live Facebook uh, lecture and tonight's topic as you know is about the methods of memorizing the Quran and one of the things that we're very passionate about here at Elmburst is to help uh, our youngsters especially and ourselves as well but especially our younger brothers and sisters in terms of connecting to the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala learning through knowledge how to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right which was the methodology of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he used knowledge of the Quran and his sunnah and, and what he taught people he used that as a way of people coming closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and especially in the way the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did this with younger members of his community in the time of the companions radiyallahu anhum ajma'een and in particular how he used the book of Allah the Quran as a way to do that and we see that very practically in the lives of the companions radiyallahu anhum ajma'een one of the things that you know like over time there's been uh, and, and in more recent times there's been a renewal or revival of is our connection with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so there was a period of time maybe you know like for our parents generation our grandparents there was a period of time where people knew the value of the Quran and they respected and revered the Quran and they loved the Quran but in terms of their connection with the Quran in terms of being able to understand the Quran and comprehend the Quran and even memorize the Quran it was very difficult for them because of very many different reasons and a wide variety of factors something that's happened over the last maybe 20 30 years is that there has been that renaissance that revival of us wanting to connect to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but through more than just its recitation and its recitation no doubt is something which has a great deal of reward it has a great deal of us being able to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of coming closer to Allah azza wa through the act of worship of its recitation but the Quran has as we know a much greater claim upon us in terms of its rights upon us and from the rights of the Quran upon us is that we understand the Quran from the rights of the Quran upon us is that we contemplate the Quran from the rights of the Quran upon us is that we act upon the Quran from the rights of the Quran upon us is that we call in accordance to the book of Allah Azza wa Jal, the Quran and from the rights of the Quran upon us is to memorize the Quran and that's something which the companions of the Prophet ﷺ did, something which they gave to their children, is something which the early generations focused a great deal of effort upon. Because a person wouldn't even start seeking other types of knowledge. They wouldn't start learning a hadith and learning fiqh and learning tafsir and other types of sciences of Islam until they had started or finished memorizing the Quran. And there are a number of narrations from amongst the Salaf in that regard that they would ask a new student, a young student, have you memorized the Quran? And if that student replied in the negative, no, I haven't, they would say, well, go back and memorize the Quran and then come to us so that we can start teaching you other types of knowledge. This is something which inshallah ta'ala is in our time, something which is a greater focus. I want to memorize the Quran. I want my children to memorize the Quran. And not just my son or one of them or the eldest, but I want all of my children to memorize the Quran. And if we make a concerted effort and we try using uh, tried and tested means and methods, we try to accomplish this goal of memorizing the Quran, then inshallah ta'ala, it's something which we will see throughout the uh, Muslim world. It's something which we'll see within our own communities. And there is a great need for us, especially in the time that we live in, with all of the challenges and the trials and everything else that's going on, there is such a massive need for us to want to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the memorization of the Qur'an. So our lecture today, and it's going to inshallah ta'ala not be an extremely long lecture, it's just going to be uh, something inshallah which we'll be aiming to do in about 40 to 45 minutes and then I want to open up some uh, time for Q&A. Our goal today is to speak about the most common methods that you will find across the Muslim world of memorizing the Qur'an. And uh, there's a couple of things that I want to mention about that. But before I do, just to let you know that the Q&A, uh, there's a post on, on the Umburst Facebook page that asks for your questions. If you can write and, and post to that, then inshallah ta'ala, I can follow them. Because I'm not following the comments on, on, the, on the Facebook feed. So uh, what you can do is you can just write in the comment section and then inshallah ta'ala, I'll pull that up uh, towards the end when we go through the questions. Any questions that you have, just type it in there and inshallah ta'ala, we'll get through as many of them as we can. When it comes to the methods of memorizing the Quran, there's not only seven. Right? I chose the number seven because it's a nice number and it's something which as we find in our Sharia or religion, the number seven, you find commonly, right? Seven circuits around the Tawaf, and uh, around the Kaaba of Tawaf, seven circuits between Safa and Marwa and Sa'i, seven pebbles that we throw at the, at the, uh, at the different uh, stations in Mina. So the number seven is just a number that I chose. It's not in any way meant to say that there is only seven. 
In fact, there are many more than seven. Number two, the second point to remember is that the number seven also doesn't mean that your teacher, if you have a teacher, or if you were to go to your local imam or sheikh in your masjid, or you were to go to someone else and you were to ask them for a methodology of how to memorize the Quran, that they will necessarily give you one of these seven. In fact, they may prefer a very different method that they perhaps taught or learned with their teachers and they took from them. But one of the reasons why I wanted to do this lecture is to show people that actually there is a greater uh, breadth and variety in terms of methodology of memorizing the Quran. You see, one of the things that we often think is that there's only one way to memorize the Quran. And that's the way many of us were brought up, right? When I was young and I used to go to our local madrasa and we were told to memorize the Quran, every single child, more or less, in that class was doing the same thing with the same method because we had the same teacher. But that method doesn't necessarily suit every single child. It's not necessarily the method that's going to suit me, that plays to my strengths, that overcomes my weaknesses and obstacles and hurdles. And we know now through modern education, even if we look at the schooling systems, that they try to make the way of teaching a child, they try to tailor it to the approach of that child. What does that child need? How can they benefit? And that more indiv individual approach to memorizing the Qur'an is also something which is needed. So when we say that the seven methods, don't worry if someone comes with another method. Don't worry if you, for example, are more comfortable with the method that I don't mention. This isn't uh, a class or a, or a lecture to say that you can only do it my way. It's to help you and to give you tips, right? And to show you that actually, if you are stuck on one method, there's actually a very different method that you can try, and a third, and a fourth, and a fifth, and so on, until you find the one that suits you. Another point that's important to mention here as well at the beginning is that actually you can combine between these methods. It doesn't just have to be so rigid that I can only take one method. Or if I follow this method, I must follow it from A to Z, from beginning to end. Actually, you can try as many methods and you can join and you can merge and you can add and you can subtract and you can get a methodology that suits you and a method that suits you and your time and your schedule and your particular situation, whether it's for you or whether it's for your children. Right? Because the methods of memorizing the Quran, remember, are not found in the Sunnah. The Prophet ﷺ didn't sit down and say to us, this is how you memorize the Quran, or this is the only way, or this is even the best way of memorizing the Quran. But it's something which people have learned and developed over time. Right? And so that's something which we have to remember as well. We're going to mention seven methods, but remember that all three of them, or all, all of them rather, and even the ones that I don't mention generally, We'll come back to three main points. They revolve around three central points. And I wanted to mention these standalone at the beginning independently so that we can kind of understand what they are. If you want to write something down from this lecture, as well as the, the methods and the general outline, these are the three points that I would impress upon you. And these are the three that you will find mentioned in the Sunnah. So as I said, the Sunnah, for example, or Hadith, or in the lives of the scholars, the early scholars of Islam, you won't find, for example, a methodology of memorization. They won't tell you, do this, and when you wake up after Fajr, do it like this, and then after Dhuhr, do this, and in the evening, do that. But what we can find from the narrations about them, in terms of how they sought knowledge, whether it's the knowledge of Quran in terms of its memorization, or whether it's the knowledge of the Sunnah, that requires great memorization because remember that much of our tradition of hadith is through memory right the scholars wouldn't necessarily write it down they would memorize it is an oral tradition also and that also therefore requires them to do what to memorize the book of allah subhanahu uh, the, the hadith of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and so they're memorizing right so that memorization tool is also extremely important for hadith and for the sunnah so when we look at all of those narrations they all, when they speak about the memorization, whether of the Qur'an or the Sunnah or Hadith, they kind of revolve around three things. Number one, and perhaps the most important, is consistency. Right? Consistency. You have to have a measure of consistency if you want to memorize something which is a great big portion. Right? If you want to memorize something which is big in, in, its, in its size, like the Qur'an, the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 30 juz, 114 surahs, 6,000 plus verses. That's something which will require time, just as someone, for example, who wants to memorize Sahih al-Bukhari, or they want to memorize Bulugh al-Maram, or they want to memorize another book from the books of Hadith. Something which requires you, even if you were going to pick a book like the 40 Hadith of Imam al-Nawawi, it would require you some level of consistency in order for you to be able to finish the memorization of even what is a relatively small collection of hadith. Consistency is extremely important. And one of the things that we find amongst the narrations of the Salaf is that consistency. Now, consistency in two ways. Number one is that they would have a set amount to memorize. 
and number two that they would memorize that set amount every so often whether that's every day, whether that's every few days, whether that's every week, whether it's once they've accomplished a goal and then move on, those are what you will find that the narrations of the Salaf revolve around. So for example, you have the famous statement of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, right, that I think most of us have probably come across, that we never used to memorize more than 10 verses in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam until we understood them and we acted upon them and we implemented them and then we would move on to the next 10. But it shows you, number one, that there's a level of consistency in terms of the, the amount that's being memorized. And there's consistency in terms of time. So that may be for them in, in, in relation to their understanding and implementation. But every so often they will move on to the next part as well. Right? So that's extremely important to remember. You have similar statements of Ibrahim al-Nakhai and others that they would say we would memorize 10 verses at a time. Right? And necessarily, that doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be every day, which is also a common mistake. One of the mistakes that we have today, or a common misconception, misunderstanding, is that unless you're memorizing a set amount a day, then you're not really doing hifth properly. Now, actually, what we find from amongst the companions and the salaf is that some of them didn't do more than one set of memorization a week. Some of them, uh, less than a week. Like, like Ibn Mas'ud is saying, until we understand something. Understanding now differs from person to person, and that can be a long time. Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, for example, as we know, in one narration of his, it said that it took him 10 years to memorize Surah Al-Baqarah. And 10 years is an extremely long time to memorize a single Surah of the Qur'an, but it's done with understanding. So they have a different goal and a different approach and methodology. Right? Some of the scholars, uh, for example, it's mention of Abu Raja. Al-Tariq rahimahullah ta'ala, who's one of the scholars of the tabi'een, from the students of the companions, he said that Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu anhu, the famous companion from the great scholars of Qur'an and from the great Qur'a, from the great reciters of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said concerning him, he said that Abu Musa wouldn't teach us more, radiallahu anhu, more than five verses at a time. So not even ten, five verses at a time, and that's what it is that you're going to memorize. Uh, Shu'bah who is the famous student of Imam Asim. So we read in our recitation of the Qur'an, we're reading the Qira'ah of Hafs. Right? We read in the recitation of Hafs. Hafs has a teacher, and his teacher is Asim. And Asim has two main students, that is Qira'ah, that is uh, rules of Tajweed and recitation became famous through. One is Asim, which is the famous one, the one that's read the world over by Muslims. And the second is Shu'ba. Shu'ba says that when I would go to Asim, he would only let me read to him five verses a day. Five verses verses a day that's all he's doing right and these are people who are advanced they're not like young children or people who are beginner students but they would only memorize five verses a day in fact you will find amongst the scholars of the salaf such as is mentioned in the name of uh, in the scholar yahya ibn wathab rahimahullah ta'ala that they would only memorize a single verse a day one verse a day that's all they did one verse a day so the point is here consistency is extremely important that's what we find amongst the early scholars but it's also important because even if you're memorizing one verse a day by the end of the year you've memorized 300 odd verses and so you're progressing that progression is extremely important the moment that you give up or the moment that you think i need a three-month break or the moment that you think that i'm not doing enough and so you completely stop is the moment that you don't progress but if you're progressing even with a verse a day I would say even if it's just a couple of verses a week, that's all you can manage. But you're still progressing. Imagine now for most of us right now, maybe you're in your 20s, or in your 30s, or 40s, whatever age you are now. Had we applied this very methodology for the last 10, 15, 20 years, how much of the Qur'an would we have memorized? And perhaps most likely we would have finished the memorization of the Qur'an. So consistency, number one, is extremely important. Number two, the second issue. Uh, which you will find in the narrations of the early scholars and the companions, is the need of a teacher. And what I mean by teacher isn't necessarily a formal concept of a teacher that you have to pay or that you have to go. That's good if you can find someone who's qualified and has that position and then you can go to them and read to them. That's something which is important and it's something which is very, very crucial for a student, especially a young person that wants to memorize the Qur'an. Now, whether that's the imam of your masjid, or it's a Qur'an hifth teacher, or it's someone in the family who can fulfill that role, and what I mean by that role, preferably, is there someone who has some experience in tajweed and recitation, and the ability to be fluent, fluency in reading? That's ideally what you want. But the position of a teacher is important. Why? Because it helps you with the first point 
consistency comes from where you have accountability. If you have no accountability to have the self-discipline to remain consistent for a very long project, is extremely difficult. Now that consistency or accountability can come from a teacher, but as I said, that teacher could be your best friend. And together you make the firm conviction and intention that you're actually going to memorize the Quran together. So this is a journey that you're going to go on together. And remember that this is one of the methodologies of the scholars of Islam when it comes to seeking knowledge, that they would memorize in groups, that they would study with groups, that they would have fellow students, that they would revise and learn and travel with because they help one another. The Sheikh sometimes is busy. Your teacher may be busy. Your teacher doesn't have time to give you that one-to-one level of dedication that you may want or require or need. But when you have people around you that can fill in that gap, that can help, that can help to uh, to fill in some of those holes that you may have, then that's something which takes you a long way as well. And that's something which you find amongst the methodology of the scholars. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ, when you look at his learning of the Qur'an, the Prophet ﷺ has a teacher. The Prophet ﷺ didn't just read the Qur'an from out of his own mind or from something. Allah Azza wa could have given him the Qur'an in many different ways. How is it given? Revelation in that way is always given through an angel. Jibreel alayhi salam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in the Qur'an, فَإِذَا قَرَأْنَاهُ فَاتَّبِعْ قُرْآنَ So if the Qur'an is being read, then follow its recitation. And that's to make sure that you're reading the Qur'an correctly because there is nothing more difficult, as we know, than memorizing the Qur'an incorrectly or having lots of mistakes and then trying to go back and rectify them because your tajweed was incorrect or you memorized the verse incorrectly or you read it wrong. And so now it's embedded within your memory and now you're being told actually it was incorrect, you have to go back and redo it. That's more difficult. That's something which you need. So if at the very least you don't have anything else, just be able to listen to a recitation and follow it along as we are now able to do with you know the hundreds and thousands of uh, of, of uh, video uh, of recitation that you will hear on YouTube and everywhere else. It's so easy for you now to be able to do at least some of that. Is that ideal? No. The ideal case would be for you to have an actual teacher that's qualified. But if you can't, it doesn't mean that you can't do anything. And we are very fortunate in that way. So that's the second point. Number one is... The issue of consistency in terms of the lines that you're reading and memorizing and in terms of how often you're doing that. Number two is a level of accountability by a teacher, but also more than accountability, they help you in terms of your tajweed to make sure that your reading is correct and fluent. And when you know that you have the added pressure that you have to read to someone, that kind of keeps you on your toes. right? If you know that you just have to do your memorization, I don't feel like doing it today. So I'm going to slack and I, tomorrow I'm busy and the next day I, I just feel tired and the fourth day I don't feel in the mood. And so now the whole week I, I rarely did anything. But if I know that every day I have to read at a certain time to a teacher and that teacher's serious and they've taken that time from their busy schedule and if I go to them I'm going to let them down, then that's something which puts pressure upon you. Right? I remember one of the stories, uh, one of the uh, incidents that took place uh, that I don't forget is when I was getting my ijaz in Medina from our Sheikh Sayyid Lashin Abul Farha Rahimahullah Ta'ala and he used to have many students, right? many students and everyone goes to him and they read what they meant to read him to get the ijaz of the Qur'an. So these are people who have memorized the Qur'an, they finished. They want the ijaz back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam which is a chain of narration that takes from you back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that you're reciting the Qur'an correctly and you've memorized it correctly. I remember on more than one occasion, another student would come to the sheikh and they would have mistakes. And not, when I say mistakes, I don't mean they, they didn't know anything. I mean that they would have three or four mistakes in maybe three or four pages that they were reading. Our sheikh would have a methodology. If you make more than three mistakes in two and a half or three pages of reading of the Quran by memory, he would tell you to go. Go back and learn it again. And sometimes he would become upset and he would say, I don't have time for this. Can't you see how many students are around me? If you can't spend the time to learn those three pages correctly, I can't give you the time to be able to listen to you. That adds pressure upon you. Because even though that wasn't directed at me, I felt the message. I knew that I I can't just turn up to the sheikh without having revised and revised and knowing what I'm going to read to him. Because I don't want to be in that position where the sheikh calls me out in front of everyone. That's something which is a lesson that you learn. That accountability, therefore helps you especially if you're serious that can come from a friend as i said it can come from but someone who can put that kind of pressure on you if it's just going to be someone who if you say i'm i'm not doing it today there's gonna be like okay fine no problem that doesn't really give you that accountability and that's why in with young kids you know parents have such an amazing and important role otherwise you never get to 
see them having the goal achieved and that and that vision achieved of memorizing the Quran. If you're not as a parent, as a mother and father, willing to put that extra pressure on them, even if they have a teacher, that teacher's with them an hour a day, maybe half an hour, two hours, three hours a day, but the rest of the time to make sure they've done the work, they're revising, they know what they're doing, that comes from you as the father, the mother, the parent. That's where that pressure comes from and that accountability also comes from. The third point, therefore, that you find that the scholars of old would have when it comes to memorization, and there's really no other way of getting around this, is repetition. If you look at the different narrations and you look at their different stories and you look at their different methodologies of memorizing the Quran, it actually comes back to repetition. And that is the way that you have to memorize. Unless you are one of those people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed and endowed with a gift of photographic memory or being able to hear something and have immediate recall, which some people have. And it is a gift that Allah gives to some people, like even in our own tradition and history, the likes of an Imam al-Bukhari and Imam al-Shafi'i alayhi wa rahmatullah and others, even though they don't say we have photographic memory, but when you look at their narrations, it seems like they almost have some type of memory of that type of recall, where they can hear something and memorize it instantly and not forget it. In fact, it said Imam al-Shafi'i would often cover up the second page of a book so that he doesn't mix up the page order, memorizes the second page before the first page. It said that in his biography, rahimahullah ta'ala. The point of this being is, repetition is where it comes in for the vast majority of us. The hard work, the effort, and remember it is ibadah. It's an act of worship. So when I'm standing or sitting there doing 20, 30 times repetition of a single verse of the Quran, that isn't time wasted. That's not just effort that's being expended for no use or no great benefit. That is every single word of the Quran that I am getting rewarded for. Time that I am getting rewarded for. Effort that Allah Azza wa Jal, inshaAllah is giving me reward for. It is ibadah and it is seeking knowledge at its highest level. Because there's no greater form of seeking knowledge than seeking the knowledge of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Quran. And so repetition is what you find. And you find this not only in the Quran, but you find it in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. In fact, in the Sunnah you find that the Prophet ﷺ, the companions would say, we only memorize this Surah because of how often the Prophet ﷺ would read it in his Salah, meaning in the loud prayers. Surah Qaf or some other Surah of the Quran because he's reading it in Salatul Jumu'ah or he's reading it ﷺ in Fajr or he's reading it in one of the prayers, companions are memorizing it. And we all know that to be the case, right? How many times have you heard your, if you maybe not even memorize certain Surahs, but because an Imam reads it so much like Surah A'la and Ghashiya, right, in Salatul Jumu'ah every week, every week, every week, that helps to embed within you that memorization. How many times have you seen little children, young children, memorize portions of the Quran or maybe even whole Surahs and they can't even read. They haven't even started their Quran journey. But they memorized it because of repetition. Right? And this is something which you find also when it comes to the Sunnah and Hadith. One of the scholars uh, was asked by one of his students, that, oh, Sheikh, I try to memorize the Hadith and I forget it. I come back the next day, I try again and I forget it. How do you remember Hadith? He says, because I went over the same Hadith 500 times. I repeated it 500 times. Right? And one of the uh, slightly funnier stories in this regard is it said that one of the scholars of old, what he used to do is in his house at night, when people were asleep, he would spend the night awake revising over what he'd learned. And he's repeating and repeating the hadith and so on because he wants to memorize them. So he spends the whole night memorizing, memorizing, memorizing. He, me- he does this so often that his neighbor says to him one day, that I've memorized what you're meant to. And he's not a scholar, the neighbor's just like an average Muslim, he's just going about his business. But because he's being kept awake at night because of his revision of his neighbor and how loud he is and so on, he says to him one day that I've memorized what you've memorized. I know what you need to know. Right? I've done it now because of how much you repeated it to me. So repetition is something that you find. These three points are basically the seven methods that I'm going to mention and others kind of revolve around this. There is a d- degree of accountability that is needed, however that's done. Otherwise, it doesn't matter how great the method is, you will find that you're not able to follow it through. If you have that ability to hold yourself to account, and maybe that's possible for some people, then alhamdulillah, right? Because you know it's reward of the Qur'an and you know the, the nobility of, of, of the effort that you're trying to make and so on. So that's good. If not, then you need someone who can give you that accountability. Right, so the companions had the Prophet ﷺ, they had one another, the students of the companions had the companions, and so on and so forth. Number two is consistency. You re- need a level of consistency. 
and that consistency has to be there otherwise what happens is you won't achieve your goal you won't get to the end because you'll keep dropping off and it is difficult to keep going back to something that is so uh, you know looks like it's a mammoth task like memorizing the whole quran may seem to a lot of people like it's a mammoth task if you don't have consistency you don't achieve anything ask any quran student today that's either memorized the quran or is very close to or has done 15 20 juz ask them to look back at how much they've done and whether they imagine they would have gotten so far every one of them can probably remember the time when they were still on the first juz that they were memorizing the second juz and they looked at all of those pages that were left from the quran and they were like i'm never gonna do this this is never going to happen but they plodded along every day, chipped away few verses at a time, and with that consistency and by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they were able to achieve what they were able to achieve. That's an extremely important point that shouldn't be disregarded. And number three then is repetition, right? Repetition. You have to put in that time of e- and effort, and there are different ways to do that, and inshallah, that's what we're going to focus on, the different ways and the different systems that you can use. But essentially, this still re- requires from you a degree of repetition, and repetition is something which will help you not only in terms of the initial memorization, repetition is needed in terms of the revision and retaining what it is that you have memorized from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, method number one. Method number one. This is the method that I, uh, and I'm, I've given each one of these a title just for the sake of this lecture. These are official names, right? You don't find these in books. It's not what they're called. If you t- say to someone else, uh, you know, do you know about this method? They'll probably say no. Even if they know the method, they won't know its name. It's a name that I've just given to it. The first method is a method that I call ideal for uh, young children or even beginners. And this is the method that I used as I was memorizing the Quran as a young child. It's the method that, that I was told by our te- my teacher and, and so on. And it's not a method that I, you know, I wasn't given choices or options or told uh, maybe you can switch. This is just the method that we had. And it's the one that I started with and, and more or less it's the one that I kind of continued with. And what that method does basically is it divides your memorization into three. Number one is the new lines that you're going to memorize, whether on a daily basis or whatever it may be. Number two is your recent revision. So that's like what you've done in the last like maybe week or so, or if you're doing a surah that's longer, the beginning of the surah until where you are now. And number three, the third part or component of this is your old revision. So for a student that starts day one, right, they decide that I'm going to do one verse a day. One verse a day. So just to keep this as a simple example, today I'm doing قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ right? That's my revision. That's what I'm going to learn. So I repeat that and I learn that and I memorize it. The next day when I come, I'm going on to the next verse. Verse number two, مَلِكِ nas. Now that I've memorized verse number two, my recent revision is day one and day two. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ مَلِكِ nas. Right? And what happens over time, obviously, you don't have all revision yet, but over time what will happen is as you increase, as you've now memorized half a juz, as you memorize a juz, now you break it into three components. So a new a new memorization today, I'm doing Amma Yatasa'alun, right? The the first surah of the 30th juz, because I was working in reverse order. So Amma Yatasa'alun, that's what I'm going to memorize today. My recent revision will be Surah Naziat, and maybe Surah Abasa, the last two surahs that I memorized. And my old revision is I'm going to start from Nas and I'm going to carry on, maybe do three pages a day, four pages, five pages a day, one page a day, whatever it is that I want to do. And when I finish that old revision, I go back. And as my new revision, right, the recent revision increases as because I'm progressing, the old revision kind of adds to it consistently, right? The old revision is getting longer and longer. The new revision is kind of staying where it is, or the recent revision is kind of staying where it is because it's just kind of following me along as I progress, and my new lines are also progressing. Now, one of the most impo- one of the common questions that I get and one of the most important points to remember is that there is no limit as to, no minimum or maximum as to how much you can memorize. Most people start with one verse, right? And then you work your way up. You go to two verses and three, and four, and then you will find that you're doing half a page, and then you find some students are doing a page a day, some are doing two pages a day, some are doing even three pages a day, and more. That's a system that you can develop. There is no right or wrong. If you have a teacher that's qualified, you have a teacher that's good, maybe they can help you, and they can give you pointers and tips, and they can say to you, actually, I think you're ready now for more. 
or I don't think you're quite ready yet, stick to where you are. And it's just depends on how easy it is then for you to be able to memorize. Remember, because memorizing is a muscle that you're using that most of us don't use very often. So as you train that muscle, it becomes stronger and you become more adept. You become better suited to memorization. And as you do that, inshallah ta'ala, you continue to progress. So this is method number one. Method number one is basically very good for a young child that has some kind of system. What they do is that they're going to break it up. And the good thing about this method is that it will keep your revision strong. Because anyone that's a Quran student, that's done a good number of, of juz of the Quran, a good portion of the Quran, or anyone that's memorized the Quran will tell you that the battle of memorizing the Quran is not just in memorization. Actually, the real battle is in revision. That's where the real hard work is. Because you can memorize 10 lines a day or two pages a day. But remembering them a week on, a month on, a year on, that's the hard part. That's where a lot of the effort goes goes through. So with this method, it's very good because what it does for you is it kind of forces you to memorize the Quran in that way. Right? It kind of forces you to keep that revision going as you're progressing. So that's methodology number one. And if there's nothing clear, inshallah ta'ala, about any of this, then in the Q&A, feel free to ask me for more uh, information. Method number two is similar. Uh, it's called the night before method. And what this is, is especially good for younger children as they're progressing. Uh, but also younger children who, as you can see, that they have the ability to memorize, that they're adept, adept at memorizing. They have, inshallah ta'ala, that ability and that skill. It's something to help them along. And what it is, is it's a very similar method to method number one. But what you're doing is you're trying to make it easier for them. Because children, especially at a young age, will first start off with a, lot, a great deal of ambition and enthusiasm. Right? You come to a young child and you say to that child, you know, I want you to memorize the Quran, especially if they've seen people memorize the Quran, lead the Salah, maybe they have siblings that are memorizing the Quran, they'll really be enthusiastic. Age 5, age 6, age 7, wherever they are, they want to start. But what will quickly happen is after maybe a week or a few weeks or a few months, is now they start to struggle. Because the initial catch of this is exciting and so on, has now started to dwindle. But at the same time, the work now is actually getting harder. It's not getting easier because now they have to do revision and so on. So one of the things that you can do is make this easier. And actually, it's very good for an adult as well. If you want to memorize, and it's one of those methods of doing repetition without really doing uh, as much repetition as, as, as you would normally. The way that it works is the night before, when you before you go to bed, you will learn what you're going to do the next day by repeating over it at least 10, 15, 20 times. So if I'm going to, for example, memorize today the first verse of Surah, uh, you know, Surah uh, Naba, Amma yatasa'alun. That's what I'm going to memorize tomorrow. Rather than waiting tomorrow and struggling in the morning, I'm going to actually read just by looking 15 times, 20 times, 30 times, as much as I can before I go to bed. If it's three, four, five verses, the five verses over and over and just by looking i'm not trying to memorize i'm not trying to learn i'm simply reading by looking and what happens as we know is when you go to sleep some of what, what was your short-term memory goes into your longer-term memory kind of embeds itself at the very least you will become familiar now an extra step that you can do that's also very good especially for younger children is that you get them then to listen to it as they're going to sleep so as they're in bed right and they're tucked in and so on you have it on the loop so you have a favorite reciter of theirs, whichever reciter they choose or you choose, and he's reading the same verses on a loop, right? And so he's reading, And then he starts again, And I guarantee if I was just, and we don't have time for this, but if I was to practically do this now, 15, 20 minutes, just do this right now with you, and you haven't memorized this surah, it will at the very least make you more familiar with it. And the slower the recitation, the better. So if you can find someone like Sheikh Husari, Sheikh Nishawi, Sheikh Abdul Basit, Abdul Samad, rahmatullah, someone who reads slowly at a slower pace, not taraweeh, but they're reading slowly, it's a studio recording or something of that nature, that will actually be better. And it will help them, inshallah ta'ala. What then happens is in the morning, they're going to memorize. Before they memorize, again, get them to read it by looking maybe five times, ten times, fifteen times, depending on what you have available to you. And now get them to memorize. Insha'Allah, you will find that they will have memorized those three verses, five verses, ten verses. And you can continue to do this, by the way, even if you're doing a page a day. It will help you greatly in your memorization. Makes it so much easier for you. And if you try this, and I have practically tried this with my own children, it's something which works 
in a very great way because it helps you just to become familiar. And the whole point, remember, of repetition is that it embeds that, uh, those verses into you. Right? It makes them more familiar to you. The first time you read it, you struggle. Amma yatasa'arun is a verse that you never heard of before. It's difficult. It doesn't roll off the tongue very easily. But by the 10th or 15th time, you're more fluent. By the 30th, 40th time, it is easy now. You don't even have to look anymore. You've memorized it without even trying to memorize it. Right? And that's the benefit and the beauty of this particular method. And then obviously in terms of revision and so on, you continue to do as we did in method number one. Method number three is one which is very common in a in the Muslim countries across the world, especially where they have full time hifth schools. Right? Full time Quran schools and hifth schools where people, because it's a Muslim country, can go to a school where they just focus on memorization of the Quran and they can do uh, uh, that and it is very intensive. And in our kind of setting in the West, I would say it's a good method uh, if you're a homeschooler, right? And your child your child is at home for a great deal of the time it's actually a very good method to do and it's something which is uh, also very because it's de- heavily dependent upon um, upon repetition and because you're going to be doing as, as we'll see now you're going to be doing a lot of repetition and reading throughout the day then it's something which is time intensive so if someone's going to school full time and so on maybe it doesn't suit them best but if you have the time, or you do this, for example, in the summer holidays, the summer break, where you have a few good few weeks or so on, this is, this, is a, this is a very good method. It's heavily reliant upon repetition. And the way that it works is that you have three to five times during the day that you just read by looking the verses that you want to memorize. So for example, right, just to give an example, I'm going to, do, I'm going to choose my three times of the day as after Fajr, after Dhuhr, after Asr. Each one of those three times, what I will do is simply sit down and read by looking. And I will read for half an hour those verses by looking nothing else. I don't look, I don't try to memorize, I don't try to learn, I don't, I'm just reading by looking. And what you'll find, by the way, with a lot of these methods, and a common mistake that is made, is where Quran students are under the false impression or misunderstanding that they have to be able to memorize off the bat. Read it twice, three times, you should be able to start memorizing now. Actually, what you will find across all of these methods is repetition is by looking, not by heart. Of course, there's a time that will have to come during that day or during that session, some point that you have to learn by heart, right? That's the whole point of memorization. But the work, the hard work beforehand is by looking, by reading, right? And one common method, for example, if you, and this isn't a method that I mentioned because I don't think it's practical for many people, but if you go to, for example, Mauritania and some of those countries, uh, Muslim countries in the world, their method of memorization is also by writing. So they use more senses. They write down the the Uthmani script of the Quran. They're writing the verses down, literally on some kind of a tablet that they have or a born that they keep, and the child writes it down. So they're learning script as well, but they're learning by reading and writing at the same time. That process is always done by looking. And so the more that you get your, your yourself or your child into that habit, the easier, inshallah ta'ala, it will become. So what is this method? I have three times a day. After Fajr, I will read for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, just by looking my five verses. And I'm doing this for 20 minutes straight. Then I stop. Go and do whatever I need to do, whatever. After Dhuhr, after I pray, I do the same thing. And the reason I'm choosing Salat times is because that's how it's done in the Muslim world. Because it's just easier for consistency. You know that this is part of your routine. Right? Whereas if you don't link it to something like that, just to have that self-discipline that I'm going to do at 10 a.m. and 2, a, 2 p.m. and 5 p.m. is more difficult to do. But Salah is a very good way even for us uh, as, as Muslims in the West. It's a very good anchor because it connects us with the Salah and it connects us with the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you do the same time thing after Dhuhr. Then you do the same thing after Asr. Then what you will do is in the evening you will memorize. And inshallah, within a few minutes, you'll have memorized. In fact, you'll probably have memorized it even before you come to that part at the end of your third session. You can probably just memorize. What then happens is as you've increased your memorization, your, your reading, what you do is you add one or two extra sessions for revision. And that revision can also be by looking and by heart. So the first session, so if I have two sessions now, so I start Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr is my reading sessions. But just before Dhuhr, maybe an hour before Dhuhr, and just after Maghrib, between Maghrib and Isha, are my revision sessions. The one in the morning, I will use to read my revision by looking. And the one in the evening, I will do it by memory. 
Right? And that's how they do it in the Muslim world. And that's why these full-time Quran schools, and it may not necessarily be this type of timing that I've given you, but it's of a similar type. You know, It's just like a, a di slight difference here and there. That's what they're doing. That's what they're focusing on. So that's the third methodology. right? And that's the intense methodology for those people who are able to do it. Methodology number four, or method number four, is the quick hif. The quick hif memorization package if you like and that's because these this is for people who have that ability to memorize very quickly so there are a good number of people and many young children who have the ability to memorize very quickly especially if they start at a young age they develop that muscle by the time they reach the age of eight nine ten they can actually memorize a page or two a day and so this methodology is basically you memorizing a page or two a day because if you can do like even um, a page a day you've more or less finished the Quran uh, within within 18 months to two years, right? That's what you've done. And that's why when you hear about people, you know, you hear those stories of someone memorized the Quran in six months, someone did it in a year, someone did it in two years. This is the method that they're using. What it depends on is your ability to memorize very quickly. Now, during the day, though, as they're memorizing that one page, they're still following the methodologies that I've mentioned to you before. They're still maybe repeating the night before. They're still doing like hundreds of repetitions a day of that page. But what they're doing is they're not limiting themselves to five verses here or ten verses there. And by the way, even the ones that I've mentioned to you, the methodologies, doesn't necessarily mean it has to be daily. You could say, I'm going to do this over every two to three days. I don't want to memorize more than five, six verses every two to three days because that's what I'm able to do at the moment. You could do that, right? But with this method, method number four, which is the quick hef, no, they're going to be doing this every single day. And they do that, and, and this is also something common which you'll find in, in, in hef schools where they want to make the students graduate and leave within a short space of time or they want to advance them in onto some other type of Islamic studies. So what they're doing is they're doing this type of memorization. The downside to this one is that there won't be much time for revision and their revision will be weak because they've spent so much time trying to do a page a day or two pages a day, and that requires intense preparation and time, the downside is that they didn't have as much time left for revision. Right? One of the ways that they combat this in, in, in certain schools and so on is that they memorize five days a week, and the weekend is just for revision, which isn't ideal because ideally you want to be doing some level of revision every single day. But this is how they do it in some places because it's you know the best of the situation that they have. They have a goal to meet, and so they do five days a week, and that's why some you know you'll find that it takes them two years, two and a half years, because they're not doing seven days or six days a week. They're doing four or five days a week, and then they're doing maybe two or three days of revision. So it has you know like uh, as with all of these, you will find that there's slight variations, and that's why. As I said before, you can swap and change and you can add and take away and you can use different combinations of this. So you don't have to stick to only one methodology. Even the, the Quran schools themselves, the ones that actually, you know, this is their kind of model. This is what they base all of their students upon. They will vary it every so often because of the need or because of what it is that they have to do. Method number five is the, what, I, what is called, or what I call anyway, the Friday routine, right? The Friday routine. And it's called the Friday routine, and, and Friday is just an example, it could be any day of the week. But it's called the Friday routine because Friday is the day in which you stop learning that week's lessons and you do the revision. So it's a bit similar to um, to uh, the quick heft in the sense that you do only three or four days. But in this scenario, you're doing six days of revision, uh, six days of memorization, one day of revision. And the way that it works is that every single day you're going to memorize a few lines. But you're not going to focus too much on revision so the first three methods that we mentioned right the first three that we mentioned whether it was the the you know the one that you split your reading into three categories whether it's the one where you it's about the night before uh, memorization all of those the first three that i mentioned were heavily also in terms of revision they were heavily based on revision so as you're memorizing you're still doing your revision as you go along methods number uh, four and five so the quick heft and this one focuses on memorization more than revision so in method number four you're just memorizing a page two pages a day one day a week you'll do revision right or, or two three days a week rather in the weekend you'll do revision this one is that you're memorizing not as much you don't want to finish within a week or two right or after a year or two or a few months you don't mind it taking longer 
So your, your memorization every day is only going to be five lines or ten lines or half a page or maybe less than that, a couple of verses. But you're doing that every day, but you're not doing revision. Why is this method used or who is it for? It's for people who don't have the time to focus on revision. They don't have the time to focus on revision. Or maybe, for example, um, you know, it's, it's used in some uh, Quran schools where they have not enough teachers for students. So the teachers can listen to new memorization, but they don't have necessarily the time to do revision. How do they then combat that is one day a week, which will be the Saturday or the Friday, because Friday in most Muslim countries is the day off. The Friday is basically the day that they do the revision for the whole week. So the whole week, that's where you're going to do your revision, right? And this is good if, for example, just say you're a parent at home, you have two or three children, and you find it difficult now to help all of them with their lines and their revision, their recent revision, their old revision. It's a lot to do, especially when you have a few students, right? And this isn't your full-time thing. You're not. It's not something which you can dedicate to. You're still a father you, or a mother. You have work. You have other chores, responsibilities. This is a good way to do it. So you're focusing just on new lines, and you're not focusing so much on revision. Now, does that have a downside? Of course. Your revision won't be as strong. But one of the things, remember, in these methods, the, what they're looking at, and, and this is what you will find in many Quran schools, and this is an important thing to remember. They acknowledge the fact and they submit to it. The fact that you will, inshallah ta'ala, after you finish memorizing the Quran, you have nothing left to do for the rest of your life except revise. Because the point isn't that you finish memorizing the Quran and then you put the Quran away and you're never going to look at it again or read it again or go over it again. The point is that you, now that you've finished the rest of your life, you're doing ibadah through the Quran. You're reading and you're, and you're revising and, you're, and, and this is what you're doing for the rest of your life. So what they will do is when these students finish their Quran, they know that it's going to be weak. Right? Not as strong as someone who did it the other way, maybe method one or two. Their Quran, inshallah, will be far stronger. Right? And you can ask people about this. Right, People who generally had a very strong hift is because they followed a methodology that was very heavy on revision. How do these Quran schools then combat that? What do they do to make up for that shortfall? Is after you finish the next year or so, it's solid revision. So that year that you've, met, that you've now graduated the Quran, for the next year you do solid revision. Right? And you can find even in countries like Pakistan and India where they have these full-time schools, you ask your students, you ask the students that have been there or, you know, we have imams in this country that have graduated from those systems, they will tell you, I finished the Quran in two years, in 18 months, but then for another year what I did is I focused on revision because they had to make up for that. Whereas, you know, someone like me who used method number one, alhamdulillah, by the time I finished, I didn't have to do solid revision like that for a year. My Quran generally, alhamdulillah, was pretty strong. And so when I was even uh, you know, doing my GCSEs or in Medina and so on, I didn't have to put in the time and effort to do revision that I saw many of my fellow students have to do because they had a different methodology that they had used in their country. There is no right or wrong to this. Now, it is obviously sinful to neglect the Qur'an, to forget the Qur'an. But it's allowed for you to have a different system in terms of revising the Qur'an, right? So your intention isn't that you want to forget the Qur'an or leave the Qur'an. Your intention is that you're using a different method that inshallah ta'ala suits your, your uh, ability right? and suits your situation. And that's something which is common in the Muslim countries across the world. And so that's why you often come, or sometimes you come across people that have memorized the Qur'an, you ask them to read to you and it will be very weak. They'll say to you, no, I can't lead taraweeh, or I can't do, just read like that. You have to give me a good half hour to go over what I, what I, what this surah, and then I can read it to you by memory. I can't just read it off the bat like that because their revision isn't as strong, right? For whatever reason that may have been, and so you kind of have to choose, right? It is a judgment call. For younger children, inshallah, it's not a major issue because for them, what they have to do is. You know, they have, inshallah, when they finish at the age of 11, 12, 13, whatever age, they have the rest of their life to work on revision. And that will help them, especially because they memorize the Quran at a young age when their minds and brains were, were more fresh. For someone who's older and is trying to memorize the Quran, it is more difficult to do this. Because you have so many responsibilities now, even to dedicate that time to revision is harder. And that's why you find amongst the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, many of whom accepted Islam well into their 20s, 30s, 40s, they were adults when they came into Islam, the methodology of the companions that you find is not this method of the quick hifth, of the Friday routine. It is method number one and two, the narrations that I mentioned to you of Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu and Ibrahim al nakhai and Shu'bah and those others, because that was the general methodology of the Salaf. And for them, it wasn't an issue of finishing, right? They weren't so preoccupied about this thing that we have to finish in this set time. 
for them, uh, even if it took them years or decades to do. It was ibadah and worship, and they were happy to dedicate that time to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's worship. Method number six, the penultimate method, is what I call the slow but steady. Slow but steady. And basically it's called slow but steady because you're only memorizing once a week. You're only memorizing once a week. And what it really is good for is for people who don't have that strength of memory. They don't have the strength of memory and they can't just do it within a couple of years or even four or five years. It's going to take them a lot longer. But what they have is the discipline and consistency to continue. And I personally know sheikhs, right, scholars, who memorize the Quran in this way because maybe they didn't start seeking knowledge from a young age. They came into practicing and wanting to learn about Islam and seeking knowledge and their own journey started in later on in their late teens or 20s or 30s. So they couldn't memorize the Quran in that same way with that same speed and focus so they memorized it in this way I personally know them and they did it very well and the way that it works is that every single day you're going to read the lines that you're going to memorize so just say for example those same verses of Amma Yitisa'alun you're going to read them and and many of them will actually do more than five lines they'll do half a page ten uh, a page a week because they're only memorizing once a week and, and generally this is a method that adults will use rather than children Every single day after every prayer, you're going to read by looking the lines that you want to memorize 10 times. That's 50 times a day. 10 times after Fajr, 10 after Dhuhr, 10 after Asr, 10 after Maghrib, 10 after Isha. I've now done 50 times a day or 20 times if you have the time. So, for example, one of the sheikhs that I personally know did this. He said that I would go to the masjid, pray Fajr. Right after salah, any salah, each of the five salahs after the salah, I would sit and after I do my dhikr, I would take out my Quran, my mushaf, and I would read that page 10 times, 15 times. Takes about maybe 5, 10, 15 minutes maximum, right? Five minutes, maybe 10 minutes, and then I would go. After the hot, do the same. After asr, do the same. Okay, that's now. Let's say it's Saturday. Sunday, I do the same thing. Monday, I do the same thing. Tuesday, I do the same thing. Wednesday, all the way up till Friday. Friday is my memorization day. So now, 6 times 50, 300 times that whole week, I've just read those verses by looking, that page by looking. Now, even if you're someone who struggles with memorizing the Quran, you find it difficult, I think that by the end of that week, you will have been able, to, inshallah ta'ala, to memorize that page. I think you would have been come, able to become to grips. And what this particular sheikh, one of the examples of or one of the sheikhs that uses method would say, is that then on Friday, where I come and do, is before Jum'ah, I come early, maybe half an hour, 45 minutes, get to the masjid, and I memorize it there. And he said, I don't even need the 45 minutes, I can do Surah Kahf as well and everything else, because I'm so familiar, 300 times in the week. But every week I'm just doing one page. So it's slow, but it's steady. And you will memorize. And then what you can do throughout the week, because you you got the whole week to play with, your revision becomes stronger as well. Because with every page, you can add the next page. So three, four, five times in the week, in those six days of just reading by looking, you can actually join between last week's page and this week's page, between the last few pages and this one. And then Friday, you can use that time to do the revision by heart as well. I know personally people that have done this. And I think this is a method that's very good for someone who, for example, now is an adult, wants to memorize the Quran, wants to make that effort, even if they can't memorize all of it, to do as much as they can, to memorize the favorite surahs of the Quran, the surahs that they love to read and hear its recitation. I think that this is something which, inshallah ta'ala, is a very good method for you, but it requires discipline and consistency. As I said before, all of these methods require that level of consistency and discipline. Otherwise, they don't work. The final method is the one that uh, is recommended by one of the imams of the Haram in Medina. And that is Sheikh Abdul Muhsin al-Qasim. Hafizahullah ta'ala. Sheikh Muhsin al-Qasim, as you know, is is one of the imams of the Prophet's mosque, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in Medina. He's been an imam there for many, many years. He's actually visited the UK uh, a few times as well. And he has, in, in the Masjid of Medina, he has very large classes. He has like hundreds of students who come to him, not only to read Quran, but they come to him to memorize short texts of Islamic studies, to memorize hadith, to memorize fiqh, to memorize aqidah, to memorize tafsir. They come to him because he has a methodology and an explanation that he does for them that has worked. And it's done very well, mashallah, it's very successful. And he has hundreds of students. If you actually go, if you know where he sits in the haram, if you go for Umrah or for Hajj, you will actually find him sitting between prayers there with his students. Now, most people don't know who he is. He just looks like every other Saudi gentleman with his scarf and so on because he doesn't look like no one knows he's the imam. Unless you know he's the imam, you know what he looks like. He's just sitting there. But if you know where he sits and where his students are, you will see many of them around him. 
and after Isha, he spends much time with them. He has a methodology of memorizing the Quran, which is similar to the previous one, uh, but it's basically the same intensity, but every day. So what he says is you do verse number one 20 times by looking. So, عَمَّ يَتَسَاءَلُونَ عَمَّ يَتَسَاءَلُونَ عَمَّ يَتَسَاءَلُونَ And I do that 20 times, 30 times. Then I move on to verse number 2. عَنِ النَّبَئِ الْعَظِيمِ عَنِ النَّبَئِ الْعَظِيمِ And I do that 20 times, 30 times as well. And then verse number 3. And then verse number 4. Depending on how many you want to do a day, if you want to do, for example, just 4 verses a day, when you come to the halfway mark, which is 2 verses, you do two, both verse 1 and 2 together, 20 times as well. So I've done Amma Yatasa'alun 20 times. I did Anin Naba Il Azim 20 times. Now I will do 20 times the two of them together. Then I move on to verse number 3. And then verse number 4, 20 times each. Then 20 times together. Alladihum fihi mukhtalifun kalla se'alamun. That's 20 times together. Now I will do 20 times for all four together. I hope you're following this. So 20 times each, but depending on how you want to divide it, every two or three or four verses, depending on how much you're doing in that sitting, how much you're learning a day, or however often you want to memorize, then you're going to split it into equal components. Do those verses together to join them. And that's important because memorization, if you just memorize each verse by itself independently, you will always find that you're making mistakes when it comes to figuring out what comes after this verse, what's next, which one comes next. So they always make you join between them, right? They always make you join between them. And this is his methodology, right? And again, as you can see, it's very heavily dependent on repetition by looking and you're doing a lot of it. So it's similar to verse uh, method six, but it's not over a week. It's basically a day, it's intensive. And you're doing the same type of methodology. And he actually uses this method not just for the memorization of um, of, uh, of Quran, but also for the memorization of hadith and verses of poetry, for example, uh, and other types of Islamic sciences as well. So these are the seven methods that I wanted to share with you. As I said, I find them to be some of the most common methods that you find uh, in the Muslim world. And as I said to you before, you know, it's not about finding or using necessarily even one of these, but to find the one that you're most comfortable with. And what I want you to understand is that there are there's many different ways and methods, and you can find one that's most comfortable to you. Don't become pressured by other people, whether because they you know say that, it, that you can't do it, it's too hard, you're going to fail, or because they're super successful, mashallah. And because of that, you look at them, and when you compare yourself, you think that it's too difficult. There is always a methodology. There are people who memorize the Quran in their 60s and 70s. There are companions of the Prophet who memorized the Quran and they were in their middle age and some of them older. And so there's plenty of, uh, of, of methodology. There's plenty of methods out there that will help you. You just have to find the one that works for you. And you have to have that discipline. You have to kind of have that consistency. You have to, uh, inshallah ta'ala, have, be, that, be willing to repeat in that way. And inshallah ta'ala, you will find that is something which will make it, which will become, which will come easier to you. And with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help and with His blessing, you will be from amongst those people who inshallah ta'ala memorizes the Quran. So that kind of took longer than I thought that it would. Um, but let me ask if there's any questions now, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, as I said, you can post them on, on the Facebook page and I will try to go through a few of them now. I, I don't want to make this too long. It's already longer than I anticipated. But inshallah ta'ala, what I will do is go through as many as I can. And then inshallah ta'ala, I hope that we can do more of these kind of lectures where we look at like different um, different aspects of our relationship with the Qur'an and in terms of its memorization in particular. So, um, how do I make my children more interested in the study of... Uh, I think, sorry, just one second. I want to see all of them. Okay. Okay, how do I make my children more interested in the study of the Qur'an? How do I help them memorize the Quran at an early stage of their lives? That's a you know a, it's a long answer that's required for that because there's many things that you can do. I think one of the things that's very important is number one to lead by example. When your children, especially if they're young in age, see you take an active role and interest in wanting to learn the Quran, study the Quran, memorize the Quran, that's something which will inspire them, especially younger children. Younger children obviously look up to their parents as their main role models. And when they see you focusing so much on seeking knowledge and learning Quran, it's something which brushes off on them. 
Now, when those children get older, when they pass a certain age, when they start going to, for example, secondary school and start ent- entering into teenage years, that's not necessarily going to be the case. They don't necessarily see you in that same way or follow your lead in that same way. So if you have young children, that's one of the ways that you can do and learn with them. If you find that there, for example, someone, you know, your child needs help in terms of the tajweed, learn tajweed with them. So not only will you be able to help them, but you help yourself as well. And you kind of like, you know, you're not always relying upon other people. I know it takes time and it's difficult, but it's something which inshallah ta'ala you will see the fruits of if you're willing to put in that time and effort with them as well inshallah ta'ala. I'm giving uh, very brief uh, answers to these questions, so I do apologize for that. How do we teach Quran to a dyslexic child? So with dyslexia now, like as we know, there are people who are experts on this and they, and they have even in mainstream education different methods and approaches that will help you to help a child that is dyslexic in terms of memorizing the Quran. And the same would be said, for example, if, the, if, a, if a child, for example, has some type of Asperger syndrome or something else. Using those same tools in Quran is a very good idea. So for example, one of the things that I found that they do with the dyslexic children is that they have a certain type of, of a ruler or some type of an implement where they, uh, you know, in order to stop the or to prevent the child from becoming confused with too many words on a page, it kind of blocks out everything else and the ruler is, is hollow in the middle. So it kind of just shows the verse that they're reading or the line in the book that they're meant to be reading. So to use that same concept in the Quran, there's nothing wrong with that, right? There's no reason why you can't. So, and I'm not an expert in this. This isn't my field. Uh, it's not something which I researched greatly as well. But it's something which you will find the methods that people have out there to, you know, if your child's getting that kind of support in mainstream education, a good number of those methods, I think you will be able to adapt to their Quran learning as well, right? And the same would be, for example, some ch- child that, for example, maybe have some type of maybe on the Asperger scale, if they have some type of condition like that that gives them super focus because we know children with those types of conditions actually are very super focused very intelligent in their own way they just don't learn in the way that maybe other people learn to find what helps them in that regard and and tune that towards the quran will inshallah ta'ala give them that ability to actually memorize the quran and maybe even do it in a much better way you just have to be willing to be flexible one of the most important things in quran learning is flexibility and one of the difficulties of recent times uh, you know, in, in our institutions and our madrasas and masajid and so on is the lack of flexibility. And so when a child comes from a school environment where it's very flexible and very open and it's very much based on the concept of enjoying your learning and they go into a very rigid system that's very difficult and strict and if you can't do it one way, there's no hope for you. That's very difficult for a child to be able to adapt to and that's why many children therefore not only struggle with the Quran, they just give up completely. How do I maintain a drive and consistency to memorize the Quran? I do focus every few days. So that depends on you as an individual, right? Um, You know, if you already know, as you said in the question, you know the reward, you know the benefits of memorizing the Quran and so on. It seems to me the issue is one, therefore, more of accountability. You lose focus because there's no one there to pull you back, right? And one of the reasons why, you know, the methodology of some of the scholars is that they make the, their students accountable. They give them a level of accountability. So for example, some of our teachers would only listen to you, Quran teachers, they only listen to students after Fajr. Because that's the level of accountability. You have to be in the masjid for Salatul Fajr. And if you can't do that, for whatever reason, then I'm not the teacher for you, you're not the student for me. Right? Level of accountability is extremely important, especially in that kind of situation. So you need a group of people, you need uh, a teacher, you need someone that will inshallah ta'ala push you in that way. And Allah knows best. What is the best age for memorizing the Quran for kids? There is, in all honesty, no best age, right? There's no best age for adults, for kids. There's no best method for memorizing the Quran. These uh, issues differ from person to person. Each person will relate to their experience. So someone may say method number one that I mentioned today was the best. Someone say, may say method seven is best. Why is it best? Maybe because one suited one better and the other suited the other person better. Likewise, when it comes to age, you know your child best. My general advice would be, however, to start as young as possible. Children, even at the age of three or four, can start memorizing the Quran just by repetition. If you read, even if they can't read the Quran, by repetition, by virtue of you reading to them Surah Ikhlas and Surah Nas and Surah Fatiha, as you know, they will memorize those surahs. So why stop at just the five, six, seven small surahs of the Quran? I know people that have been able to help their children memorize three, four juz of the Quran. Three to four juz of the Quran and the child's five, six years old just by repetition. 
They can't read. They're still learning Alif Ba Ta. They can't read fluently the Quran, but they can hear and they can repeat. And so you're there literally spoon feeding them. Amma, 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 Yatasa'alun, Amma. And you're doing that over and over. And you're using kind of the same methodology that we're doing, that we've mentioned some of those methods. You're adding a step. The step is that you must orally do it with them. You can't just leave them to their own devices. You need to literally manage the process for them, but it is possible. So my advice to you is always start with them as young as possible, but there's not really a best age. But the younger that someone starts, inshallah ta'ala, the quicker that they won't finish and the easier that they won't find it. Allah knows best. Okay. Um, if we cannot memorize long surahs, are there any specific verses that is recommended from the sunnah that we learn? So, you know, like in... in um, in my view, and Allah Azza wa knows best, is that there's not necessarily a methodology in terms of what surahs, where you have to start and finish in terms of memorizing the Quran. So if you want to start from Baqarah and go to Nas, it's okay. And if you want to start from Nas and go to Baqarah, it's okay. And if you want to do Maryam first, and then Surah Yusuf, and then Surah Hajj, and then some other surahs, and you want to work in that way, it's okay. And if you want to mention memorize certain parts of the Quran, it's okay. Right, and then move on to other parts. Your goal, in my honest view, should always be to memorize the whole Quran. That should always be our aspiration. The way that you want to do that, what you choose to put forward and back, is up to you. And the, and the evidence for that, and Allah knows best, is the fact that the Prophet ﷺ, the companions, memorized in that way. The Prophet ﷺ didn't receive the Quran, starting with Fatiha and ending with Nas. Started with Iqra, as we know, then Muntathir, then Muzzamil, and then other surahs of the Quran, sometimes complete surahs in their entirety, sometimes verses and passages at a time. And that's how they memorize the Quran. And so you can do the same thing, right? So some, that's what I mean by flexibility. You know that your child, in order to inspire them, encourage them to memorize the Qur'an, they love Surah Taha. They love Surah al Gahf. They love this Surah or that Surah. And they're always listening to it and they love it. Get them to memorize that Surah first. Maybe it will be a springboard for them, inshallah ta'ala, to go on to memorize other parts of the Qur'an. Right? So um, inshallah ta'ala, I think that we will uh, conclude... There, uh, can you please explain method number one, a way of revision again, please? So, method number one, you have two types of revision: recent revision, which is what you've learned in the last week, or maybe, for example, if you're doing a surah like surah kahf, what you've memorized of that surah up until this point. But I would always use the last week as a general measure for recent revision, and then old revision, which is everything that you've done before. So you've done maybe two juz before, three juz before. That's how you should do it, right? And so you memorize your new lines. You go over your recent revision every day and you go over your old revision every day. That's the method that we would use. And Allah knows best. But it is obviously time intensive. Okay. What is the best way to memorize along with understanding? Or should we only focus on memorization and understanding separately? You don't have to separate the two. You can do them together. But one shouldn't be an excuse for not doing the other. right? So some people may say, you know, I only want to memorize after I've done tafsir. But you know... That you're never going to do tafsir and if you do it it's going to take you years to accomplish so you don't have to separate them in that way and that by the way isn't also the methodology of the scholars because even amongst the companions there were young companions who weren't at the level of Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu who's from the senior older more knowledgeable companions in terms of memorization of the Quran so you can memorize and learn at the same time that requires really from you that type of effort and dedication. If you're someone who can read five verses, for example, you memorize 10 verses this week or 15 verses, to have that discipline to then go and learn tafsir and learn the translation and study with someone what it means, that's obviously amazing. And that's something which will not only increase you in terms of your memorization, but in terms of your knowledge and connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your khushu' and salah and so on. But that's something which requires a great deal of effort and time. If you can do that, then that's good. But if not, then don't let shaitan use it as an excuse for you not being able to memorize in the Qur'an. Right? For the last method, when do we memorize? The last method, Shams al-Qasim, is you just choose the time for yourself. So once you've done all of that repetition, you choose the time. And with all of this, it's flexible. In all of these methods, the times that I gave are just by example. Whether you want to do Fajr or Isha or whatever, every person is different. Right? Um, you know, a number of my teachers would recommend Fajr is a good time to actually do the memorizations, even if you're doing all the repetition the day before. And every Fajr after Fajr is your memorization time, so you're always kind of doing it in that cycle. They would memor they would recommend that because you're generally fresh at that time of the morning. Right? That's what they would say. But obviously, in those countries, after Fajr you don't go back to sleep. That's your start of your day, and you get up and and that's why you're fresh. You've had breakfast and so on. So that's like different. 
I'm 40 plus, I don't have an imam to sit with, how can I start memorizing? Start memorizing yourself. So listen to recitation of the Qur'an, find a good reciter, a reciter that reads slowly, and learn with them, read with them. Just as a child, we would go through with them Surah Ikhlas by repetition, by hearing, they have to do the same. Your situation, if it means that you don't have access to anyone else, and by the way, there's plenty of online institutions now, online teachers that do this, by the way, the world over. So it's not even the case now that you're stuck somewhere and you don't have anyone in your locality that you can't reach anyone. Obviously, as long as you can afford to pay them, there are people now who do this online anyway, and especially in this COVID world now, most of this stuff is online. So you can find people to help you, but if not, then use recitation of the Qur'an to listen to and to repeat after and to memorize in that way. The most important thing is repetition. So however you get that repetition done, inshallah ta'ala, it will help you. Okay, folks, jazakumullah khair for attending. Barakallahu feekum. I hope that inshallah ta'ala you've benefited. This uh, video will be available. So this, this is going to stay on our Facebook page. Uh, you know, you're more than welcome, inshallah ta'ala, to... Uh, to share this with others and to and to uh, watch it again and forward it and so on and please do inshallah ta'ala and if you like this page and keep up with our post then inshallah ta'ala we can uh, keep you updated with all the other events that we do and the courses that we run and the lectures that we give on this and similar topics barakallahu feekum wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh